Hi, this is Miss D, and these are your notes on water and temperature. And specifically, we're going to be talking about how water um, moderates temperature in ecosystems and organisms. So we're going to talk initially about water's high specific heat and high heat of vaporization, which sounds like chemistry. So let's go back and define what the specific heat is. The specific heat of a substance is how much heat is required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So basically the specific heat of water is how much heat do I have to add to the water to make the water one degree Celsius hotter, right? Um, and water has a really high specific heat. What does that mean? It means that it takes a lot of heat energy to actually make water change its temperature. Now, Let's, let's just think about that. If I have a frying pan sitting on the stove and I put some water in it, what heats up first, the metal or the water? The metal. Uh, if I'm walking outside in Texas in the summer on concrete barefoot, what's hotter, a puddle or the concrete? The concrete. So water is going to go ahead and maintain a more constant temperature. Now, um, that's partially dependent on the size of the body of water, the, the larger the quantity of water, the better it is at, at maintaining its, um, its temperature, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about right now. So let's, let's look at our example. I have a body of water um, that is by a coastal region, so I have land and water, and I'm going to have some heat coming down and heating both the land and the water up. Basically, the high specific heat of water says that the land will end up hotter than the water because the water takes more heat to raise the temperature. So that means that um, areas that are close to coasts are going to have more moderate temperatures because you've got that huge body of water actually helping to, to uh, remove some of the heat from that system. So instead of all that heat going to the land, some of it's going to the water, but the water doesn't heat up as much. So coastal regions are tend to be more temperate in climate because of the high specific heat of water. And that helps maintain those coastal biomes as, as separate. So if you look all down the, the coasts of um, most continents, you find similar, similar um, weather conditions and climate conditions as opposed to inland. So why? Well, it's all due to the hydrogen bonds that we talked about. So anytime I have hydrogen bonding between waters um, and I want to break those hydrogen bonds, heat is going to be absorbed. Anytime that I have hydrogen bonds forming, heat is going to be released. Um, so because of that, whenever I have a bunch of hydrogen bonding in water, it's going to require a lot of heat energy to go ahead and cause those bonds to break down and for me to go from a liquid form to a vapor form. So if I want to switch the phase of water from liquid water to water vapor to a gas, what's going to have to happen is I have to add a ton of heat there, right, to go ahead and um, to break all of those hydrogen bonds. So that heat is going to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and be released into the atmosphere ultimately because as the as the, the heat is added and then the waters break apart, you're you're adding heat to the water, but um, but then as the water vapor releases, the water becomes part of the atmosphere. So that contributes to that high heat of vaporization. Basically, what that means is it requires a lot of heat to force water to go into a gaseous form. So. Um, all of the hydrogen bonding between all of the molecules that we've talked about when water is in a liquid form, what happens is you have to break all of those hydrogen bonds before one of those water molecules can evaporate. So that's going to take us into evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling, uh, I think everyone's heard of before, is when you have the cooling of a surface um, when the liquid evaporates. That's really all it means. So I, I know I used my my word evaporate in my definition, but that's that's what's happening. So when um, when you sweat and the sweat goes from the liquid on your skin to um, to a gas, what's going to happen is it's going to remove heat and you're going to cool off. So how does that happen? Um, this contributes to a lot of different uh, biological 
phenomenon. Uh, one is the maintaining of temperature in aquatic ecosystems. So evaporative cooling helps maintain uh, proper temperature in aquatic ecosystems. Uh, you can imagine that if there's constantly organisms swimming around in the aquatic ecosystems and they're constantly generating body heat, then the water's constantly heating up. Well, that, that heat has to go someplace. Um, so because it's, it's water, you're going to go ahead and be able to remove some of that heat through evaporative cooling. Uh, one of the other things it does is it helps maintain the Earth's climates um, through the water cycle. So that evaporative cooling helps to go through and maintain um, the, the climates. It removes heat from different areas, and it also, as the water evaporates and then condenses and falls back down, it's going to also go ahead and contribute to the lowering of temperature um, and, and maintaining the climate through, through precipitation also. And then um, the... The last thing we want to talk about is preventing organisms from overheating because they're actually evaporatively cooling by sweating. So you can imagine that you are better at evaporative cooling than, say, a dog is because you can sweat and you have all of this skin surface that evaporation can take place off of, whereas a dog is going to be covered in fur and it's not going to be as efficient at evaporative cooling. Um, so let's actually look at what has to happen. Uh, to evaporatively cool. So I've got my water molecules and I've got my hydrogen bonding between the water molecules. I have to add energy to break them down and that's going to release the heat from, um, from whatever substance it is. So if I have my skin, let me draw in some sweat glands and the capillaries carry blood. As your blood heats up, they're going to go ahead and uh, pass by the capillaries um, and the capillaries pass by your sweat glands. And so what happens is your body is going to um, have heated sweat, right? So the sweat is going to be warm because it's coming in contact with those warm capillaries. And as the sweat glands release the sweat, that covers the surface of your skin, and then that's going to go ahead and evaporatively cool. So it's going to evaporate, you're going to release heat into the atmosphere, and so that's how we maintain our homeostasis. So sweating is evaporative cooling, and that's how we, uh, we go ahead and regulate our body temperature. So that's it for um, talking about the interaction between heat and water. Uh, I've very, very briefly skimmed over this. There's a lot more depth that we could go into, but we would have to start talking um, some thermodynamics. If you have any questions, come in and talk to me. Um, we probably don't want to do that one through email. And that's it. I hope it helps.